Hi, this is Duncan Ferguson. In this unit on the adrenal medulla, I'd like to talk about the physiological role of the catecholamines in the body and also pathophysiological conditions that you might run into as a clinician that affect the adrenal medulla. So what's the physiological role of catecholamines? Well, the primary uh, reason they're around is to help us combat stress. Uh, and they regulate intermediary metabolism, in particular the major fuel of the body, uh, glucose. And in this effect, epinephrine is roughly 10 times more potent than norepinephrine in regulating intermediary metabolism. And of course, what we're talking about here are things such as uh, glycogenolysis and lipolysis. What are the kind of things that will stimulate adrenomedullary secretion? Well, stress, which is a general thing, fight or flight, and uh, of course you're preparing for exams, you might be able to appreciate this. Um, trauma, uh, which is a stress, of course. Hypothermia, particularly in neonates, will stimulate uh, adrenomedullary secretion. Uh, and probably the strongest response, and I really want to emphasize this for you to think about, is hypoglycemia. And this will be associated uh, with dramatic uh, epinephrine release and an attempt to counter-regulate regulate this hypoglycemia. And, and the other is hypotension. And this is part of the baroreceptor response, which you'll learn more about later in, in a different uh, course as you talk about cardiovascular system. So how do catecholamines work uh, at the side of the cell in a molecular fashion? they activate receptors. And these receptors uh, can be characterized uh, as alpha and beta receptors in a total of five different types. Alpha-1, alpha-2, beta-1, beta-2, and beta-3. And we'll highlight where each of these receptors is existing in tissues. All of these are seven membrane-spanning receptors, are G-protein coupled receptors, and uh, basically they, ha they can couple to different types of uh, G proteins, uh, G inhibitory or stimulatory proteins, or the GQ, which, which connects to uh, things such as the response of phospholipase C and calcium. Uh, and it's important to note the same adrenal receptor can couple to a different type of G protein in one tissue to another. This is sometimes hard for people to appreciate, but each tissue has its own signaling transduction pathways. Uh, it is the G protein which converts the biological response. So for example, we know that all of the beta receptors are mediated through adenylate cyclase. We know the alpha-2 receptor um, can inactivate or inhibit the adenylate cyclase. And we know that the alpha-1 receptor can stimulate phospholipase C. So in this cartoon, we have a depiction of the typical catecholamine receptor uh, that's a G-protein coupled receptor. And we show here, uh, for example, epinephrine uh, binding to its receptor. And of course, it can bind uh, to any one of, I'm only showing three here, it can bind to basically all the receptors we just described in the previous slide. Uh, but I wanted to highlight uh, how, for instance, alpha-1 receptor through G-coupled protein will then stimulate phospholipase C. That's where the asterisks, so follow the asterisks for the effects, and that effect would be stimulating inositol triphosphate and calcium, whereas the beta-1 or beta-2 receptors, uh, I'll do that in a different color here, in blue, are going to uh, go through a G protein coupled receptor, but their enzyme they're linking to is adenylate cyclase and they produce cyclic AMP. So here I wanna highlight some of the key adrenergic responses of tissues and we're gonna pull it all together at the end to look at how an animal responds to stress and what we call the fight or flight syndrome. Uh, basically the effects on the heart are uh, through the beta-1 receptors, and these are to increase the strength and the rate 
of the uh, heartbeat, and these are mainly on the SA node. Uh, the effects of, on the blood vessels would be mostly through alpha-1 receptors, and these would lead to vasoconstriction. So this is to try to bring core blood back into the co core of the animal to uh, facilitate the uh, carrying of oxygen around the main important uh, tissues uh, during a stressful incident. And then on the blood vessels, this is uh, maybe a little bit counter to what you'd expect. The, the peripheral vessels, um, and those including the coronary and the muscle, coronary artery and the muscle, will actually vasodilate because guess what? These are important for the response to a stress. The heart and the muscle needs to be perfused with um, substrate and oxygen uh, during a stressful incident. And in the, in the kidney, we actually get uh, beta-1 receptors that can stimulate renin release. And if you remember your uh, unit on mineralocorticoids, the stimulation of the RAA, renin, angiotensin, aldosterone system, will actually lead to uh, the increase of sodium retention and um, also water retention following sodium and as well as the angiotensin has a very significant um, vasoconstricting role. So angiotensin, it goes to vasoconstriction also. What about some of the things that the adrenal uh, medullary response and catecholamines might inhibit? Well, you'd expect that it would start because the sympathetic nervous system is acting counter to our uh, you know, sort of the vegetative system, such as the digestive system. Uh, you'd get inhibition of things like insulin release, and indeed that happens. So inhibition of release, in, insulin release, increased glucagon. Why? We, we want uh, glucagon to help epinephrine increase glucose. Remember, they work together as counter-regulatory hormones to insulin. And with and then so when we think about um, drugs that might block the alpha receptors, then or if we stimulate beta receptors, these actually can lead to increased insulin secretion. And drugs that block the beta receptor can lead to decreased insulin secretion. This becomes important when we start uh, using drugs and animals to control these receptors and we might be treating a diabetic at the same time. So if they have a little bit of insulin secretion, um, they might uh, have that affected by these, by these responses. Continuing our look at adrenergic responses of tissues, let's look at the liver first. Uh, through the uh, beta-2 receptors, we see increased gluconeogenesis. Through uh, alpha-1 and beta-2 receptors, we see increased glycogenolysis. Both of these meant to increase plasma glucose. As far as uh, the adipose tissue, you'll see beta-2, beta-3 receptors stimulating lipolysis. And in order to bring in more oxygen to the animal that, as it needs it to um, provide the oxygen for metabolism, we see bronchodilation, which is due to a beta-2 receptor effect to cause smooth muscle dilation uh, in the bronchial tree. Uh, and then there's the effects that would be for those species that have uh, piloerector muscles in their skin. We have an alpha-1 effect that leads to the piloerection. And in those spe species that sweat, such as a horse, you can see sweating due to alpha-1 receptor stimulation. So let's summarize some of the interactions that the catecholamines have with other endocrine systems. We already mentioned that glucocorticoids are crucial to the synthesis of epinephrine specifically. Um, glucocorticoids also set up the peripheral response to catecholamines by increasing the number of catecholamine receptors in key tissues like blood vessels and the heart. So what's the clinical significance of this? If an animal is glucocorticoid deficient, such as an Addison's disease or uh, in too rapid removal of glucocorticoids, uh, you may see that they are not able to respond with a uh, blood pressure response 
in the tissue to a catecholamine release, uh, such as during uh, adrenal medullary stimulation and in low blood pressure. So this means that the glucocorticoids need to be replaced first in order for that response to normalize. You already mentioned that catecholamines can reduce insulin secretion from the beta cells and they actually increase renin, we mentioned that in previous slides, from the kidney. Um, and that stimulates the RAA system. And then dopamine, um, particularly through its central effects in the, in the central nervous system, will inhibit prolactin release and, stim and also inhibit ACTH secretion. Uh, it has a tonic effect on the, uh, to suppress ACTH secretion, particularly in the intermediate lobe of species like the horse and the dog. Other effects of catecholamines that you might see in an animal that's stressed uh, is a midriatic effect through alpha-1 receptors that leads to the uh, pupil dilation. Uh, you will see decreased motility of the stomach intestines through alpha-2 receptors. You'll see increased uh, contraction of the stomach sphincters, such as the gastroesophageal and gastroduodenal um, sphincters. Uh, this is mediated by dopamine and uh, by probably by epinephrine through alpha-2 receptors. And then you'll in see, in see increased contraction of the urinary bladder sphincter through alpha-1 receptors. And this, of course, um, doesn't always work. Uh, sometimes an excited animal will nonetheless overwhelm this and urinate on the floor for you. All of those disseminated effects on the body I uh, will review for you at the end of this uh, presentation shortly, but I wanted to talk about one condition that, you, that clinicians can see that's associated with the uh, tumor of the adrenal medulla. Basically, this can be seen particularly in species like the dog and cattle, particularly uh, bulls, and it's usually a benign tumor, but it can invade the tissue locally. And to give you an idea of how similar uh, this is to a constant sort of a stress response, you can see that the signs we would expect to find in a dog are the increased heart rate and uh, forcefulness of the heartbeat through beta-1 receptors stimulated um, and that on the SA node. You can see vasoconstriction through the alpha-1 receptors. You can see loss of fat deposits through the beta-3 receptor. They may be mildly hyperglycemic through the glycogenolysis. Remember, we said that's also a beta-2 effect, as well as alpha-1. And, of course, increased excitability and anxiety in the tissue, which seems to be an alpha-1 effect. Um, generally, alpha-2 receptors um, are associated with a calming effect. And we use that clinically with some drugs that stimulate alpha-2 receptors. And then we have the dilated pupils due to the alpha-1 receptors. So summarizing the fight or flight response is a great way to end this unit and to uh, have you review uh, the effects of catecholamines on the body. It's a very disseminated response. And included in that response is the uh, beta-1 res response of the heart to increase its uh, heart rate and contractility. This occurs at the SA node. A dilation of coronary blood vessels to increase uh, flow to the heart itself, the heart muscles, beta-2 receptor. Increased blood flow to the muscles, also beta-2 receptor. Uh, vasoconstriction, that is to prevent the sort of peripheral uh, blood flow um, and allow most of it to go to the core tissues like muscles uh, in the heart. And this is a vasoconstrictive alpha-1 effect. Bronchodilation to bring more oxygen to the animal uh, during the stress. And then, of course, all the things that are, in, are designed to increase blood glucose. Beta-2 receptors stimulate gluconeogenesis. Alpha-2 receptors inhibit insulin secretion to allow glucose to rise. Alpha-1 and beta-2 receptors stimulate liver glycogenolysis. And then, in addition, we got release of fatty acids through beta-2 beta-3 receptors, and finally, uh, piloerection for con contraction of hair muscles, and we can add into that sweating through the same alpha-1 receptor effect.